Hello everyone. Have you ever wondered how your DAW can communicate with external controllers? In this video, we're going to have a look at that and we're going to analyze how can they synchronize together. So if, for instance, when I load a new track like this, you'll see that straight away the faders take over the um, right setting from the DAW. And if I then change the faders, you can see that in the DAW, these new values are straight away up there. Now the controller that I use um, is based on the Mackie control algorithm. Uh, and you'll see in your DAW that there's very many different algorithms that it can use to communicate with external controllers. So you might want to see which controller, uh, which algorithm your controller uses. Uh, nonetheless, you'll find that uh, many of these uh, control algorithms are, are really similar. And I'll show you some tips and tricks on how you can analyze this protocol yourself. Um, if, for instance, you want to reverse engineer it or make your own controller. So let's get to it. In the demonstration today, I'll be using uh, Ableton as a DAW. But it doesn't really matter what DAW you're using. Uh, any DAW will be able to control a control service. You'll just need to go to the preferences. And then under MIDI, you'll find a capability to configure uh, control services. In this Ableton program, you can configure up to six at the same time. As you can see, there's tons of protocols there. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's many that use the Mackie control protocol, and that's why we'll focus on this. Uh, but in a similar fashion, you could analyze any one of these. I uh, sent the information to the Project Mix control service and receive also from that. But you could actually also uh, use a standard MIDI port if you just want to debug what's coming from the computer. But we will actually start by looking at what is the Project Mix sending to the DAW. And so that's where, of course, the actual project mix needs to be configured. And in order to analyze that, we're going to use a, a free piece of software called MIDIOX. I can very much recommend you to uh, download this uh, program and um, it can be used in a very universal manner. Uh, so if you have here a synthesizer and I press a random note, then you can see that a note has been pressed on and uh, then also off. And you can then uh, see the whole MIDI structure of what was sent. Uh, just as a bit of a fresh up, uh, with MIDI, you typically send, uh, the MIDI sends bytes, and typically these are three bytes. The first one is a status byte, uh, consisting of the type of the message, note on, note off. And then the second uh, four uh, bits are the MIDI channel. Uh, so there's 16 channels to our availability. And then there's two bytes after that. The first byte, uh, data bytes. The first data byte is the actual key that we send, uh, pressed. And the second data byte is the uh, velocity. One thing to note is that um, here in MIDIOX, uh, the, you can see here the status data one and data two bytes that were received. And it also interprets it for us and says, hey, this is a G4 note and it was a note on command that was sent. Uh, but that's the interpretation from status byte 90, data 143 and data 233. But please note that these are hexadecimal values. And um, so hexadecimal values uh, need to be converted to, um, a, to, to decimal values. So we have a, a binary sequence that was sent by MIDI, and, and it's just not very um, practical to look at a lot of ones and zeros. And that's why MIDI shows this as hexadecimal values. Um, and for instance, the 43, the node G that we just sent, is in decimal values 67. I actually included in the um, link below a simple web page where you can do this conversion. And so in that web page, you can um, here, for instance, uh, write uh, 43 uh, hexadecimal, and it converts it then down to uh, the number 67. And if you now want to know which note is uh, correlated to uh, the, the decimal note 67, there's another web page for that. That's the MIDI note numbers and uh, center frequencies. Um, and here you see on the left uh, MIDI note numbers. And so we can scroll down to number 67 and see, okay, this is a G4. 
All right, so enough about MIDI. Uh, there's plenty of tutorials about that. We're going to now look at our control service because sure enough, this, so the control service in Mackie control is nothing more than a dedicated MIDI link now between the control service and the DAW. So if I uh, change something here uh, on the, um, uh, the, the DAW, I change here the uh, volume slider, then you can see that actual MIDI um, notes are sent uh, in this case it's a midi note on if i start editing the slider and then a midi note off if i stop editing and um, the value is transmitted through pitch bands and um, so the, the only thing we need to do now with this Mackie controls decipher which midi controls are used for which of these knobs and if you know that you can uh, make your own midi controller you can um, with regardless of what DAW someone is using, as long as it has Mackie control, you can interface with this DAW. And that's really the power of this Mackie control. Now, there's quite a few sites that uh, have information available uh, on Mackie control, but, th but there's no um, official documentation, unfortunately. So here I found actually one site that I think is quite a good reference and uh, but it might just be a little difficult to 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 grasp and understand so i'd like to go through this with you and make sure um, that you can use this um, yourself so there's three documents here the first one is the description of the mackie control interface and the different parameters uh, the one here below is a summary of the mackie control uh, software mappings and then here's another document about logic control, which is another interface that many of the DAWs do support that you could use as well. We're focusing today on Mackie control. Uh, so let's open this particular thing up. Now Mackie control, the original controller actually looks like this. Very similar to the one that I have, but slightly different. Nonetheless, the, the buttons are pretty much the same. And each of these buttons are now described in the table below with the mapping to the MIDI notes. So this is pretty self-explanatory here, uh, but I think it does deserve some, uh, some explanation. Let's test this thing out. Uh, we'll start with, for instance, the um, solo button. And uh, so, for instance, the, on, on the eighth channel over here on the control service, if you have a solo button and if you press that, then it's a D sharp uh, that on channel number one that is sent over. 127 is the um, on value for on and zero is the value for off. So let's have a look at that. Okay, so if I now press that solo button, which should be this one, then we see indeed it's D sharp or E flat. That's the same note, obviously. Uh, that is sent over and indeed um, it brief by sending this uh, note on command we see here that solo was um, activated if i now press it again then the solo button goes off again and all the channels are uh, are back on so the list over here can be used to directly map any of these functions to uh, the MIDI notes um, that um, we've seen. And again, these MIDI notes can be converted to decimal numbers with the website that we saw here um, that converts directly the MIDI note to a decimal number. Um, there's still a few things in this list that are a little bit tricky to understand, and I'd like to focus on that now. Um, so one of the things that you should note is um, there's potential meter, or the rotary encoders, as they call them, here on the top. There's eight of them. And these rotary encoders are, for instance, used to pan the signal from left to right. And um, you, a rotary encoder, you can turn really, really quickly. And that's where they implemented a thing where uh, it gates and uh, sees how many rotations you've had, uh, you've made. And so you for Clockwise, um, it starts at one, and for counterclockwise, it starts at 65 as value. And then if you wrote it really quickly, it goes maybe up to 10 or 12, because it, it, it tells the DAW how many ticks um, you've done in that particular time frame. Um, and then obviously the limit would be 64, because if it were 65, it would go counterclockwise. So the two directions are signaled like that. 
And um, I, I at least thought it was kind of difficult to understand this type over here, general purpose one, two, three, four, and then controller 20, 22, 23. So if we go to this uh, website that explains the control change messages, you'll find them over here and you actually can see it is uh, referred to the control um, purpose controller, um, the general purpose controller uh, one is uh, 10, 11, 12, and 13, of course, hexadecimal. So we can see this as well if we go to the DAW. And if I now change one of these rotary encoders, then we can see indeed that number 10 changed. It was one, so it was clockwise, and it's channel number one. If I go the other direction, then you can see it's 41 and you see it turned a little quicker here it became 43 or if we go really quick i can get it up to 4f or something like that but that's about it and uh, if i now change a different channel here change channel number uh, four then it's 13 14 15 16 17. So basically those rotary encoders are from hexadecimal 10 to hexadecimal 17. All right, let's go to the next one that was a little tricky and those are the volume sliders. So in the documentation, the volume sliders are referred to as faders and they're listed twice. We have first the fader touch one and then there's a fader one over here. Uh, and the reason is that whenever you touch a fader and change it, it will first send a note on command, meaning uh, identifying the DAW that there's changes on that fader coming in. Then the actual values are transmitted through pitch wheel commands. And then after you're done uh, with that fader, it will send a um, note off command again for that particular fader. So we can briefly demonstrate this as well. If I now change this particular slider over here, Then we see that um, as when I start to change it, we have a note on command, then the pitch bend values are sent over and then there's a note off. Now, why do they send this over with pitch bend? And the reason is that with a pitch bend, you can get up to 14 bits instead of just seven bits. Seven bits would just be 128 values. And that is quite crude for a volume slider. You want to have more granularity. And so with 14 bits, what is it, 16,000? points or something like that, you have significantly finer resolution. So in this particular case, we have status E7, and that's already pitch bend uh, for channel number eight. So you see MIDI channel number eight, um, status is pitch bend. And the, then the, the actual data is then data one and data two, where I think data one is the most significant bit and data number two is the least significant bit. So that pretty much concludes the communication from the control panel to the DAW itself. And with the help of this document and a good understanding of what is meant now uh, with these notes and value parameters, um, you get a long way with uh, controlling um, the DAW itself. Uh, but there's also communication from the DAW to your control panel. And you'll be able to, you'll need to be able to, to decipher that as well. So the values that we just discussed, like changing the volume slider or changing panning, will be uh, the, the same regardless of whether it comes from the control panel to the computer or from the computer, from the DAW, to your control panel. The one thing that's different though are uh, the is the display that you see on the top there. It's a little vague there in the background, but there um, you see per track an abbreviation of the track name and also what the panning of the channel is, if it's uh, in the center, in the left, or on the right, and to what percentage. And we want to be able to decipher that particular information as well. In order to decipher that, we need to really monitor uh, the MIDI controls that are sent out from the DAW to the control panel. Now you can't really use MIDI aux for that, because normally if you change parameters in the DAW and you send data out to an external device, the MIDI aux won't see that. So we need to be able to mirror this back um, to the DAW to be able to detect it. 
And that we can actually do with a small little program called Loop MIDI. Uh, so I'll briefly switch here over to the Ableton view. And uh, let me just see here. This is a, this small little program called Loop MIDI. I created two virtual MIDI ports. So we can go here to Options and the MIDI devices. And you can see I already selected here the Loop MIDI ports that I created. So how can we now mirror back uh, the MIDI signals from the DAW so that we can actually receive it? So that is actually done here in the MIDI AUX program itself by going to View and then Port Routings. And uh, this is perhaps a little bit confusing. Let me just briefly remove the um, control surface and that simplifies it significantly. Then you see the only thing I do here as I routed the loop MIDI port that I created in uh, this loop MIDI program to the second MIDI port that I created there, loop MIDI port one. And we're going to, uh, in MIDI aux, we're going to look at all the MIDI commands that come in at loop MIDI port one, uh, so that the DAW can send everything to MIDI port and it's kind of like we loop back to MIDI port one. So in the DAW, we need to, of course, now route our um, MIDI data to this loop MIDI port so that we can then monitor this. In, in preferences right now, we still write it to the project mid mix, but uh, I now select loop MIDI port here. Oh, actually not for the input, just only for the output because that's the one we want to monitor. I write the output to loop MIDI port. Okay, so by doing that, I can now maybe move this over here and then have the MIDI aux on the right. And I go back here to the MIDI monitor. If everything worked out, if I now change, for instance, um, the volume over here, then yep, sure enough, we see now whatever the DAW is sending to the control panel and uh, the, the control surface. So uh, indeed, if I actually send a pitch bend, uh, uh, if I change a volume slider, then it sends out a pitch bend. So the main thing we want to focus on now is how does the DAW communicate track names and panning to uh, the external controller? And this is done through system exclusive messages. Okay, so I figured out what the problem was and why it wasn't working before. Um, the thing was here you have two things. You have the main output monitor and then there's the display raw MIDI input. And obviously that was the one where I had to go. And sure enough, now it does play, uh, it does show system exclusive data. I actually added also the other cross connect because I wasn't sure whether I was doing it right. So uh, here in the MIDI, MIDI port routings, I had them now both, but I think I really only need one of them. So let me try to just remove this and only put this one in. I think this really should do. And if I now rename this, okay. Now it received 46 bytes of data and uh, we can take this, select it, and then uh, copy this. If we now go over to the website that we were just on before uh, that does the conversion, this can be very nice as well to convert this um, SysX data. This is all hex data, so you just throw this in into the hex uh, stuff. And there's one thing, hexadecimal values are typically written with zero, x and then the number uh, so in this case the 0x is is omitted and there's this small section here remove 0x so you gotta select that and then of course copy paste it in again if you do that um, the uh, numbers are interpreted not only as decimal values but also into ascii numbers obviously the track names you cannot uh, send letters through your um, serial channel just like that. You need to convert the letters to numbers. And letters are converted to numbers typically through the ASCII table. 
Uh, so there's tons of ASCII tables online. Just Google that and you'll see that, um, uh, for instance, here, uh, capital T, that is 54 uh, in uh, hex, uh, hexadecimal values. Uh, and uh, so if we now look at the, the string we received, F0 is in the beginning, F7 is at the end. That is normal for any system exclusive message. They also always begin with F0 and they always end at F7. Everything in between is the, the actual data we want to receive. Now, the first couple of numbers, uh, that is the, what I have selected right now, 00, 00, 66, 14, 12, 00, 00 is to identify that you're sending over the track names. You'll see that the, the PAN names is also um, a 64 um, uh, byte uh, transmission, but that um, has then slightly different numbers there in the beginning. After that, starting with 54, uh, all the way here up to 73, are then the individual track names and they're shortened to actually six characters i think let me see one two three four six yeah so <laughs> unfortunately it says now track name track name track name track name um, because i made those names way too long if i briefly go back to uh live and change those names And then we need to uh, capture this again. So let me maybe rename this once more. And then here we can do another receive manual dump. There's our 64 bits, bytes. Go back here. Now you can clearly see track one, track two, track three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And those are the eight tracks that you have on your control surface uh, where you get the names of this. And then of course, if you pan over to track two to nine or uh, three to 10 or something like that, and the names will shift um, with that as well. Um, and so you can easily decipher that, just take the number, convert it to ASCII, and you're good to go. Similar for the pan values, we can briefly change one of the pan values uh, and then get the ASCII of that. So uh, I go back over here, uh, receive manual dump. And if I just change panning like this, then we get 64 bytes. And we look at that in detail with the ASCII converter. And you'll see now 50L, 6L, 15R, 33L, 3L, 3R, uh, 10R, and 26L. And that is the amount that you're panned to the left or to the right per channel. Uh, and that's the way that it, that's uh, converted. And so in the beginning here, uh, you see again 0000, and then 66. 14. So it's slightly different from what we saw with the names before. And that's how you can differentiate between pan and track name. And so with this method, you can actually analyze any of the commands that are sent over from the DAW to the control panel. So I hope you were able to really follow along with all the steps here and um, be able to analyze now this Mackie control interface and use it for your own purpose. It's really very universal and you can use it with any DAW. It's very well suited for like a universal remote control. And I might just add another video about how to now control your DAW from, for instance, your cell phone. Uh, however, if you want to send very rapid data between your DAW and um, an external device, then I very much recommend if you're an Ableton user to look into Max for Live and the interface that I've written for that. So the link for that is above there. As usual, like so well appreciated, leave comments down below and see you in the next video.